Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello dear students, today we will learn about a basic tissue reaction called as inflammation which is a protective response of the body towards any injurious agent that gains entry into our body. Human body is constantly being surrounded by various kinds of injurious agents which include microorganisms, physical agents, toxins that are present in our environment. Now, how is our body going to tackle the damage by these injurious agents? We have what is called as defense mechanism. We have the first line of defense mechanism, the second line of defense mechanism and the third line of defense mechanism. Let us see what these mean. The first line of defense mechanism includes various physical and chemical barriers. For example, the skin that covers her body is a physical barrier that prevents any microorganisms from gaining entry into her body. The saliva and tears contain enzymes which serve as chemical barriers. The second line of defense mechanism is what we are going to learn in detail today. This is inflammation. The third line of defense mechanism includes the cellular and the humoral immunity that is the T and the B lymphocytes. Let us learn about inflammation today. Now, let us look at the schematic representation of skin. You see the skin is having the covering epithelium which is the epidermis. Beneath the epidermis is the dermis where which is basically a supporting tissue which has fibroblasts, collagen, blood vessels, etc. Now, within the blood vessels are these cells which are defense cells against any injurious agents that is the WBCs. The skin serves as the first line of defense mechanism against bacteria gaining entry into our body. Now, say there is breach in this epithelium. Now, this forms the point of entry for the bacteria to gain entry into our system. At the same time, there is damage to the cells by this foreign body. Now, this is when the inflammation or the second line of defense mechanism comes into play. Now, what happens in inflammation? Now, whenever there is entry of this bacteria and there is dead tissue, the, there are cells in our tissue which are the first responders. Although the WBCs reside within the circulatory system, there are some WBCs which are present in the tissue. Some of the monocytes exit the circulation and they lie in the tissue which are called as macrophages. Also, there are some mast cells in the tissues. Now, these recognize that something foreign has entered into our body. So, the mast cells release a chemical called as histamine. The macrophages release a chemical called as cytokines. At the same time, the microorganisms and the dead tissues also release various factors. Now, what do these do? The histamine that is released by the mast cells primarily acts on the blood vessels. Now, this acts on the blood vessel causing vasodilatation. Also, you can see here normally the endothelial cells are closely opposed to each other. Now, the histamine increases the gaps between these endothelial cells what is called as increased vascular permeability. At the same time, the chemicals that are released by various cells act on the WBCs that are present in the circulation. These WBCs predominantly neutrophils and the monocyte exit the circulation and they come to the site of injury. So, you can see here the neutrophils are moving to the site of injury. The monocytes are also moving to the site of injury. Now, these two cells are called as phagocytes. Phago means eat and cytes is cell. So, these cells 
now eat up all the injurious agents, the microorganisms and the dead tissues. Now once it has eliminated this, once they have lived their lifespan, they die due to apoptosis. At the same time here, the cytokines that are released by the macrophages cause proliferation of the fibroblasts which also lay down collagen. So basically this injured tissue is replaced by scar. So you can see here proliferation of fibroblasts, deposition of collagen and this has replaced the dead or injured tissue. So the two main features of inflammation is number one elimination of the offending agent, number two is inducing repair at the site of injury. Now without inflammation infections would go unchecked and wounds would never heal. So let us look at the definition of inflammation. Inflammation is a response of vascularized tissues to infections and damaged tissues that brings cells and molecules of host defense from the circulation to the site where it is needed in order to eliminate the offending agents. So this is exactly what we saw in the previous slide. So inflammation, the word is derived from inflame which means to set fire because any inflamed tissue will appear red and has increased heat at the site of inflammation which is why the name inflammation is derived from. Now what are all the causes of inflammation? First and foremost is the infections. Any kind of infection, bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic, etc. Tissue necrosis any condition where it, there is death of the tissue, for example when there is ischemia and hypoxic necrosis, trauma to the site of injury, physical injury, chemical injury. So basically any cause of cell death is a stimulus for inflammation to come to the site of injury and eliminate these dead or dying tissues. Any entry of foreign bodies into the body, immune reactions for example autoimmune diseases. In this condition body recognizes self antigens as foreign and there is inflammation against one's own cell. Also hypersensitivity reactions. These are the key players that play a role in inflammation. You can see all the different kinds of WBCs that play a role in inflammation to fight against any injurious agent as you can see here bacteria, viruses, necrotic tissue, foreign body, etc. So they are our microscopic soldiers. They are ready to fight against anything foreign that gains entry into our body. So how do we describe when a part of a body is showing inflammation? We use the suffix itis to the site of the inflammation. For example, when there is inflammation of the skin, we call it dermatitis. When there is inflammation of the tonsils, we call it tonsillitis. When there is inflammation of the conjunctiva, we call it conjunctivitis, etc. Now how do we clinically say that the particular site of the body is inflamed or is showing inflammation? There are five cardinal signs that are seen in case of inflammation. Number one, rubber, as you can see here, the, the part of the body here that is the foot is inflamed, it is very red in appearance. So rubber means redness, tumor, you see that the part of the body is swollen, so it is called tumor. Dolor is the part of the body will be extremely painful. Calor, if you feel the part of the body, it is, it feel, if you feel the part of the body that is inflamed, it, uh, it has a higher temperature than the rest of the body. These four signs were described by Cornelius Celsus as early in 1st century AD. The fifth sign that was added much later is called as functiolisa or loss of function. When you have inflammation of a part of the body, you obviously cannot move the body and it does not function like normal. So that is called as functiolisa or loss of function which was described by Sir Rudolf Virchow in the 19th century. So what are the types of inflammation? We could have two important types of inflammation that is the acute and the chronic. Now acute inflammation as the name says, it is of a very short duration which usually occurs within minutes to hours whereas chronic inflammation is what occurs over many days to months. 
Now, what are the cells involved in acute and chronic? Acute inflammation, the most important cells that are involved are the neutrophils and the macrophages, while in chronic inflammation, we have lymphocytes and macrophages as well. Now, the local and systemic effects, when there is acute inflammation of a part of a body, for example, sore throat, there is in addition, you have fever and other systemic signs which are prominent in acute inflammation, while in chronic inflammation, it is much less. The fibrosis and scarring is a feature that you see in chronic inflammation, but it is far less in acute inflammation. So, these are the basic differences between acute and chronic inflammation. Now, what are the sequence of events? This is what we just saw in the previous slide. The offending agent, which is located in the extravascular space, is first recognized by the host cells. Leukocytes in the plasma proteins, which are actually present within the circulation, are now recruited to the site of the injurious agent. The leukocytes in the proteins together work to destroy and eliminate the offending agent. However, this reaction is controlled and is terminated, and the damaged tissue is repaired. Let us get a better understanding of the sequence of events. You can see here the bacteria have gained entry into the body and causing damage to the host cells. Once this is recognized by the host cells, that is the macrophages, mast cells and the other kind of cells that reside in the tissues is a dendritic cell. Now, these recognize these foreign agents and then release the chemicals which we just saw are mostly histamine, cytokine. Now, the action of this is predominantly on the blood vessels and the leukocytes. In the blood vessels, it leads to vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. On the leukocyte, it causes emigration of the leukocytes from the circulation to the site of injury. Along with the leukocytes, you also have several proteins which are present in circulation like the plasma proteins, complements, kinins. These are also released to the site of injury. Now, together, this tackle the injurious agent and then destroy the damaged tissues. So, you can see here the whole thing is eliminated. So, there is clearance of bacteria and dead cells. At the same time, the macrophages have released cytokines and growth factors, which are causing proliferation of the fibroblasts and collagen, and this is the scar here. So, what are the phases of inflammation? You have two major phases of inflammation, the vascular phase and the cellular phase. In the vascular phase, there are three major events that happen. Number one is vasodilatation or dilatation of the blood vessels. Number two, increase vascular permeability and number three is stasis of the blood. In the cellular events, we see the emigration of the leukocytes from circulation to the site of offending agent. Now, let us look at these vascular events a little more in detail. Now, the first thing is vasodilatation, second increase vascular permeability and third is the stasis. Among the vascular events, the first thing that happens is vasodilatation. So, it is the earliest manifestation of acute inflammation. If you can see these two pictures on the screen, the one above is the normal circulation. In case of acute inflammation, you can see that the blood vessels have dilated and also there is more sprouting of vascular channels. This happens first in arterioles with opening of new capillary beds in the area of inflammation. This results in increased blood flow to the area, which is the cause of redness and heat at the site of inflammation. Because of increased blood flow, there is an increased hydrostatic pressure. Now, when the pressure within the blood vessels increases, there is an outflow of fluid out of the systemic circulation into the tissue. So, this outflow of fluid into the tissue early in inflammation is called as transudate. The second feature that occurs in vascular event is increased vascular permeability. This is the hallmark of acute inflammation. Why does increased vascular permeability occur? What is the mechanism behind increased vascular permeability? You can see in the normal blood vessels, the endothelial cells are closely opposed to each other without any gaps between them. Whereas, in this site of inflammation, you see increased 
gaps between the endothelial cells. Now, what causes these gaps? This occurs because of the retraction of the endothelial cells. Now, this is brought about by the action of histamine and other chemicals that are released at the site of inflammation. So, in this picture you can see here, there is an increased gap between the endothelial cells, which is because of the action of histamine and other chemicals. However, this phenomena is very short lived and occurs for only a few minutes. What takes over the mechanism of increased vascular permeability later? This occurs because of endothelial injury and necrosis. So, in this picture you can see here, the endothelial cells have been injured and because of which there are more gaps between them. Now, this is brought about by the injurious agent itself or the leukocytes. The third mechanism by which there is increased vascular permeability is transcytosis or the presence of channels in this endothelial cells. However, this mechanism is not well understood. The third event that occurs among the vascular events is stasis of the blood. Now, here in a normal vessel you can see that normally the plasma is at the periphery of the blood vessels and the cells that is the leukocytes, the red blood cells and the platelets move in the central stream. This is how the flow is in normal circulation which is called as a laminar flow. Now, what is happening in inflammation? We have seen here because the fluid is moving out, there is stasis of red cells in the blood vessels. So, the red cells are engorged within the circulation. Now, this disturbs the laminar flow and the leukocytes fall out of the central stream and marginate to the periphery of the circulation, eventually to move out of the circulation to the site of injury. So, you can see here in this picture, when compared to the normal, the red cells have accumulated in the center, there is engorgement of red cells which is stasis, because of which the cells, the white blood cells have fallen out of the central stream, what is called as margination and also eventually they move out of circulation. This collection of fluid at the site of inflammation, which is rich in proteins and cells is exudate. So, this occurs exclusively in inflammation and is a hallmark of inflammation. So, you can see here two fluids, the one on the left is a transudate and the one on the right is exudate. Transudate is seen in several condition, it is basically occurs because of hemodynamic changes like increased pressure within the circulation, which occurs early on in inflammation as we saw now because of vasodilatation. But as the inflammation progresses, there is increased vascular permeability and there is movement of cells and proteins out of circulation. This results in formation of exudate, which you can see here is cloudy and is high colored. Now, why do we need to know the difference between transudate and exudate? It has a lot of clinical implications. If you see exudate, it means that there is mostly infection and you need to treat with antibiotics, unlike transudate, which is not a feature of inflammation. So, let us look at some differences because in laboratory, you can do an analysis of the fluid and differentiate a transudate from exudate. Transudate as I told you occurs in various conditions when there is hemodynamic changes, for example, increased hydrostatic pressure, whereas exudate occurs because of increased permeability in inflamed tissues. The protein content and the cells are few in case of transudate, whereas the protein content and the cells are high in exudate, basically because there is increased permeability and there is movement of cells and proteins to the extracellular fluid. Obviously, the specific gravity is low in transudate, whereas high in exudate. The examples for a transudate, any condition where there is an increased intravascular pressure as in case of congestive heart failure or a decreased protein content or the oncotic pressure and exudate occurs exclusively in inflamed tissue and a classical example for exudate is pus. So, is inflammation good or bad for the body? Inflammation is obviously a protective mechanism, but while inflammation is occurring, there is also some damage to the 
local tissues. That is the reason our pharmacies are hounded with anti-inflammatory drugs because we want to prevent the local damage that occurs in inflammation. However, in some conditions it can have harmful consequences. Uh, for example, if inflammation is not adequately controlled or it is misdirected. For example, if inflammation occurring against one's own body cells which is autoimmune diseases or it is occurring against harmless substances. For example, some people have hypersensitivity reactions to drugs, insect bites which do not cause problems in others. And also certain diseases like type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis are now known to be conditions where inflammation plays a major role. So, to summarize, inflammation is a reaction of vascularized tissue to injury. It occurs in response to injurious agents like microorganisms, tissue necrosis, etc. It involves vascular and cellular events and the sequence of events result in emigration of leukocytes and proteins to the site of injury and the purpose of inflammation is to eliminate the injurious agent and to induce repair. Thank you.